Dear colleagues, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's a wonderful meeting and a great honor to be invited to give an overview on what's new in viral hepatitis. Well, and I organized my talk in the following way. I will talk only about Hep C and B. And to be honest, the most important things and news in viral hepatitis, of course, with Hep C, is are all the elimination programs. But this is already covered, so I will not focus on all the new data that are around what happened um, in, in all the strategies in order to eliminate hepatitis C virus infection. But I would briefly like to mention some real world data and the issue on genotype 3. What about resistance? Is it still an issue? And I think uh, there's especially new data and interesting data around people with Hep C having hepatocellular carcinoma or the risk associated with DAA and hepatocellular carcinoma and how to follow all these patients we have now cured in the long term. And with Hep B, some new data, whether there are differences between entecavir and tenofovir, I don't know. And of course, the cure strategies we are now facing, what can we do with current regimens, whether timing matters, the finite approach, and then I would like to conclude with some remarks on the new treatment options we will have, hopefully in the future for hepatitis B. So let me start with the first data from the ILC, from the ESL meeting, and one really of the largest real-world um, study showing the effectiveness of sophosbuvir, velpatasvir in the Western world, as you can see here, more than 5,000 patients included. And what you see, and this I think is the most seen in most of the real-world studies, that F compared to the clinical trials, when you look at the ITT population, the sustained response rate is always a bit lower in this real-world cohort, but when you look as, an, as treated in the per-protocol population, the efficacy is quite high. So if you look at those who had not achieved an SVR, the, most of them had a non-virological failure, 6%, and the largest amount of those had no, were lost to follow up. And I think this is really an issue and also seen in the large elimination uh, studies done here in Egypt. And it's not so easy to follow the patient after they haven't been treated. But so it's important to train our patient that it can be important and some of them need follow-up surveillance. Here's an example of a large Italian study on a more recent uh, regimen, Glasaprovir and Pibrentasvir. And again, you see here what is interesting, and this is seen in many of the Western countries, most patients, 90%, were treated for only eight weeks. Eight weeks was allowed for GP only in those without advanced fibrosis, telling you that at least in the Western countries, we probably have already treated most of the patients with more advanced disease and now have more, let's say, the easy to treat um, characteristics of the patients. And you see overall the results were very good and there's a new label now that eight weeks is also okay for all genotypes except three also for eight weeks. But you see here, and I've highlighted it in red, that especially for genotype 3, these are the only patients not achieving 99 to 100%. So there's still a question mark, what about a genotype 3? And again at ESL, there was a large study from England trying to collect all the data um, they can get um, in, with different regimen treating genotype 3 infection. And you see that depicted and divided the data to those with moderate fibrosis or to those with cirrhosis. And then clearly turned out genotype 3 can be easily treated as long as no cirrhosis is present. If cirrhosis is present, you have lower SVR rates if you only use soft well, but this can be improved if you add ribavirin. And for GP, when you go for 12 weeks instead of eight, you may also achieve similar SVR rates. So the question is really how to best treat nowadays genotype 3 infection. It's the probably most problematic genotype we um, have to treat now. And there's one controlled randomized trial I would like to share with you. It's done in Spain where uh, people were randomized with genotype 3. All had liver cirrhosis and were treated either with 12 weeks soft well or ribavirin was added. And you can see by adding ribavirin, 
the relapse rate was reduced from five, as depicted here, to two percent. So is it worth adding, worth it adding um, ribavirin for these few percentages? And probably we can define better the characteristics of the patient benefiting from um, ribavirin. And this is shown here. These are those people with baseline, natural occurring baseline resistant variants before starting treatment. And if they have any NS5A resistant associated variants, the chance for cure without ribavirin is only 84, but can be increased to 95. So a recommendation from these data is cirrhosis genotype 3. If you have the chance to test for resistant and if it's present, go for ribavirin. If not, probably it's okay to add ribavirin anyway, if you no, have no chance to test for resistance. Here, are, it's, sorry, it's difficult to read the, the recommendation whether resistant and genotype testing is um, necessary, whether you need it according to the easel guideline. And I think it's true if you have very modern um, second generation regimens, you probably don't need it. But if you have regimens like Sofel and you have uh, genotype 3, there might be a situation where genotyping and resistant testing still can be quite helpful in order to optimize your individualize your regimen. And therefore, I would like to highlight that most experience we have from clinical trials were done in the Western world. And the rare subtypes that can be found in regions like in Africa are clearly underrepresented in all these clinical trials. But we have to be aware when we think about this global em elimination strategy, as you already heard, that 15% of the global um, hepatitis C virus population and cases are in the WHO African region. So what is the impact of these rare genotypes? And there was a nice study also presented at ESL and now published in the Journal of Hepatology showing that there are really in most um, of these African countries as depicted here have very rare genotypes and especially genotype 1 subtypes that are not present in most clinical trials. You see here 1G, H, L, even a very new, not previously described subtype 1P here from Nigeria. And these variants as depicted here in the next slide, that 52% of the African population tested here had these very rare subtypes, and most of them, 82 at least of the subtype 1A, or of the genotype 1 subtypes, harbor NS5A naturally occurring resistant variants. And it was shown in this study when you treat with first generation NS5A inhibitors, like here with sofosbuvir plus letituasvir, then your cure rate for these rare genotypes, subtypes, is only 75%. You see the numbers in detail here. You know, one out of two with the genotype 1P was cured, so 50% failed. All patients with genotype 1A L failed to achieve a sustained virologic response. So it's probably really important to have these data at least if you treat with first generation NS5A inhibitors. Let me move forward to the retreatment. What about um, if a patient failed in a DAA-based treatment regimen. Of course, if you're lucky, you have a triple regimen, software Vox, very effective. And this was shown in several real-world studies presented during the last ESL meeting. You see already significant numbers coming from different regions, and the number who are failing this triple regimen is really minimal. From the phase three approval study from Softwell Vox, there was a recent subgroup analysis of the characteristics of the few patients that failed this triple regimen. And it's really intriguing that it's a, really a certain characteristic uh, for the patients who failed the triple regimen. First of all, they all had cirrhosis. In total, there were only eight patients that failed, very, very few. But all had liver cirrhosis, as you can see here. All were infected with either 1A or 3A, no one with genotype uh, 1B, were all cured, 
and most of them had resistant associated variants. Of course, they were pretreated with DAA. So the conclusion here is if you have a patient failing a DAA treatment, have a cirrhosis being 3A or 1A, there is a slight risk of failing uh, as a triple regimen and it's probably wise, at least that's what we have recommended in our German guideline to add ribavirin. But there are many countries um, that do not have these new and triple regimens or even GP, what you can use also in certain um, circumstances to treat. So how to deal then with patients failing a previous DAA regimen and does it help to do resistant analysis and according to the resistant status to select your compounds you have. And this was done in this real world cohort come from Spain and they looked specifically what was the pretreatment and I only show you here this one example where patients failed a soft lidipasvir plus minus ribavirin treatment was one of the largest group and they looked it's very <laughs> you see the individualized regimens they used this was based on the decision um, of the physician, of the treating physician, and they looked how is the outcome, how many patients were cured with this different regimen, and they looked specifically for the resistant associated variants. And here they came up and provided some evidence how to use resistant data in order to achieve SVR rates more than 90% in countries with limited access to new DAA combination, and their conclusion were if there's no NS5A resistant found, so only protease inhibitor NS3 resistant associated variants, the combination of SOF plus an NS5A plus ribavirin is okay. If it's type three with only the wide 93H, you should go for SOF velpatasvir plus ribavirin for 24 weeks. If it's an NS5A plus an NS3 RAS, treat with a triple regimen and add ribavirin. This is if you do not have GP or um, the software works as a rescue regimen. Now I would like um, to move forward to the situation of HCC um, in combination with a chronic hepatitis C virus infection and the question is what we should treat first, the tumor or the infection, and what about the risk of HCC recurrence after DAA or in cirrhotic patients when you treat with DAA, is there an increased risk of developing cancer? Sorry for the quality of this slide, but I think this is the best summary we have so far and a systematic review on all the data on the SVR rate in patients with HIV-induced cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. And overall, the cure rate is a bit less than 90%, but the lower cure rate is mainly driven by the patients with active HCC, where the HCC is not controlled, not curatively treated, where the cure rate was lower, whereas if the HCC was inactive, this means treated, the cure rate was 93%. Now, what about the issue of HCC occurrence or early recurrence in those treated with DAA treatment. I think we have now very good data showing that if you have the overall population of patients treated and you compare cirrhotic patients treated with DAA in comparison to interferon, indeed, it might slightly, the blue curve is a DAA treatment, the incidence of HEC might be a bit higher as compared to the interferon-based treatment. But the reason is that these patients were more sick as compared to the interferon era. If you weigh the data according to the severity of cirrhosis, you do not see any difference anymore. And there are interesting data if you look retrospectively with a specific MRI protocol. So you have diagnosed the HEC after you have the DAA treatment and you cured the HIV infection, but an HEC developed. And in some instances, people had an MRI before. And with this new technique, the colleagues were able to show that nodules were already present before start of treatment. So the question is, do the DAA accelerate if their nodules are present 
And this is what the Spanish group feel and believes. And again, they published a paper and say, well, probably overall there's not a big issue and a high risk. But if patients have non-categorized nodules, then the risk is three times higher to develop HCC after DAA treatment. And they still believe that DAA therapy elicits a mechanism that primes emergence of HCC early during follow-up. However, I think the most important point is outcome of the patient and survival. And we have more and more data showing that the DAA, DAA treatment after successful curative treated HCC improves survival as compared to the untreated control. And this mainly due to an improvement um, because of a reduction of decompensation. And in this um, Italian study, there was also no impact on HCC recurrence. And I think this is really important that treating the underlying liver disease is an integral part of your HCC management. So if you look at the events and the factors that are associated with survival after you have treated curatively a patient with a HCC, you see, of course, it's best if there's no event within the first year. But if the first event is a recurrent of HCC, it's less cumbersome, it's less worse as compared to those with an early hepatic compensation. So the worst prognosis is in those who had a decompensation of the disease and you can probably prevent it by effectively treating patients um, with um, their underlying disease. In interest of time, I wouldn't like to go to these um, AGA clinical practice update um, expert review panel let's say a recommendation, but they clearly state that you should treat and probably DAA therapy should not be withheld from patient with complete response to HCC therapy, but it can be deferred to four to six months to confirm the response to HCC. I think still a debate what to do with those with an advanced disease, and this is highlighted here. This must be an individual decision whether in this situation, according to the expected life expectancy of the patient, a DAA treatment should be recommended. So the last part, a few words on the follow-up. You know, patients, especially those with cirrhosis, are at risk of HCC development in the long term. And we have now very good predictors, and I would like to share them with you who is going to have a risk, and we better understand why there is a persisting risk. There's a quite nice study showing that during the long chronic infection, HCV induces epigenetic changes that are associated with the risk of HCC, and these epigenetic changes persist even if you cure hepatitis C, giving a good explanation why this happened. And the recommendations are clear throughout the world that if you have early stage disease, probably the patient need no follow-up, but for all those with more advanced disease, um, you need follow-up. And patients are especially at risk if the cirrhosis is more advanced. And the typical risk factors are a low albumin or platelets here below 120. So the risk, the yearly um, rate of HCC increases up to 70.4, so you can calculate your individual risk for the patient. You can do it more with more data like cirrhosis, SVRH, albumin, ALT, and platelet count, that you can really, with these all factors, make individual um, prediction from very low to very high three-year HCC rates. And this can be done on the internet with these risk calculators. So we'd like to move forward to hepatitis B virus infection. First of all, is there a difference with uh, respect to an entecavir or tenofovir treatment, um, especially in their effect in lowering the risk of HCC development? And this very large uh, study with more than 10,000 patients treated with either tenofovir or entecavir, well, one had the impression that the lowering effect of HCC incidence was a bit lower with entecavir, so a higher rate of HCC as, ten, as compared to tenofovir, and this was confirmed in a validation cohort. 
A similar study also coming from Korea, but the size of the study is only 10% of the previous one couldn't show this difference. But now during the ALC, uh, ILC, the ESL meeting, again a study from Hong Kong showed a lower rate of HCC when patients were treated with tenofovir as compared to entercavir. Highly statistically significant, but there might be a bias because as you see, only 5% in this cohort were treated with tenofovir and 95% with entecavir. So I think this jury is still open, but it's really something we have to follow on and I'm quite sure there will be a lot of publication, probably quite similar as to the issue with DAA and hepatocellular carcinoma. Now let's move forward to the, the cure. And this is most important, as you have heard, now we can cure so effectively Hep C, we would like to achieve the same with Hepatitis B. And so far, far we are aiming for functional cure. This means a loss of HBS antigen. Patients still have CCC DNA and integrated HPV DNA, um, but S loss is what we are aiming for. The rate of functional cure we can achieve with current regimen is not very high. With interferon in E positive, E negative around 10%. With NUC, nucleoside analog, it can, it's higher in the E positive as compared to the E negative. But even after eight years of treatment, it's only 12% or 13% for the E positives. But very disappointing for the E negative patient only about 1%. So can we increase functional cure? There's a lot of interest in combining interferons and um, direct antivirals. Well, I think there's a lot of rationale behind it, but overall, I think the results were not so impressive. There were different strategies, either de novo add-on or spit strategies. I only would like to show you one study that probably highlights best what happened. So if you combine it, the effect on lowering S levels is higher. This was seen in all of the combination studies that if you have the combination, more patients have a decline in S. At the end, the, the number of S loss is not very high. After one year, eight to zero, but after 144 weeks, not any more significant, 10 to 4% and there's a significant number of side effects that have to be kept in mind, 20% stopping um, treatment due to side effects. So although there's a strong biological rationale, I think it's still not a standard of care. Also, S rebounds occur, occur after stopping interferon, and I think it's not really the way to go. What always, well, um, I think it's an interesting point to think about is also the timing of treatment. So you know that in most countries we're treating or we do find patients when they are in their advanced stage of the chronicity of the infection and already had a zero conversion to, e, uh, to the E antigen negative state. So mostly 20, 30, even 40 years of chronic infection. So does it matter whether we start earlier with treatment? And then I think in a way we have a rationale because we already know that with E-positive disease, we can even with NUC achieve a higher <coughs> chance of S loss. And there are now recent studies, and probably Manal's would be interesting for you because it's in the, in the, children, um, in the children, whether we start very early in order to achieve cure. One randomized trial where Children in the age of seven were randomized to a control group or started early in interferon monotherapy with an add-on of lamivudine if they do not have a perfect response in the beginning. And you see the response rate are remarkable with a 30% e zero conversion and 20% S-loss. And this was not seen in the control group where uh, none of the children achieved S-loss. And even very fascinating, there's a specific form of infant hepatitis B, and in this study, they treated immediately when this infant hepatitis B was present and achieved an 83% S loss as compared to a deferred treatment where the S loss was only 36%. So all being in favor of a more earlier um, start of treatment in order to achieve cure. 
an interesting approach and it becomes important to understand these data we have from the finite approach when you stop long-term treatment with NOOCs in E antigen negative patients. And you see a summary what happened um, with respect to S loss and you see the incidence rate of S loss if you follow the patient without treatment is in the range of 20 to up to 30% after three years, but if you follow patients for more extended periods, it can be even higher. And we have shown in the only randomized trial what happened with respect to assets. If you stop and you see there are some disturbances if you stop and some of these patients showed a nice decline, whereas S levels stay completely stable if you continue treatment. So something happened if you stop and patients flare. And it's important to understand what happened after stopping, that the B virus infection runs through different phases and nearly all patients, if you stop after a certain lag period, will suffer a certain amount of reactivation. And what has been done previously, you thought the reactivation and started immediately treatment. And this according to the concept that you allow for some flares and hopefully immune reactivation, this is a wrong strategy. You have to wait for the consolidation phase to see what happened and then, as mentioned here, around 20% will lose S, another 20% will enter really a stable inactive carrier phase and the rest probably need again treatment. And it has been shown that these flares are associated with some immune reactivation so that the relapse of active replication may trigger an immunological environment that enhances responsiveness of HPV-specific cells. Now, a few words to the new strategies. I think we can talk hours um, with all the new strategies and I only would like to give you an overview and the most promising drugs. First of all, we have direct antiviral drugs that targeting either the entry inhibitors, the entry of the virus, or the release of S HBS antigens, so-called release inhibitors. We have direct antivirals targeting the capsid. These are capsid inhibitors, or very interesting interference with the RNA as a template for the proteins, and less advanced targeting CCC DNA and HBX. And on the other hand, we have a lot of immunological um, targets, either curing the hepatocytes um, with cytokines, toll-like receptor agonist, rig I agonist, or having a more specific killing, immune-mediated killing of the hepatocytes by modulation of the adaptive immunity. And here we have checkpoint inhibitors, um, T-cell engineering, T-cell receptor engineering, and also therapeutic vaccines. This is only showing you the long list. It's all early stages, many in phase one, early phase two. These are a list of direct antivirals being in clinical evaluation. And these are a list of the host target or immunological approaches being in phase one or phase two, so all early days. More advanced are the capsid inhibitors, and they are different compounds that either interfere with the packaging of the pre-genomic RNA, so leading to empty capsids, or leading to an abnormal assembly of the capsid. So you have these aggregated or abnormal capsid as shown here. So a normal capsid looks like, and here by these capsid uh, inhibitors, you have this aggregation or abnormal looking capsids. There are early clinical data showing that when you treat with these capsid inhibitors, you can lower HPV DNA and also RNA. The HPV RNA is a transcriptional activity marker of the hepatitis B virus infection. But so far, not huge effects on HBS antigen. There's also the issue of resistance, so most likely you need combination therapies. And an interesting combination partner for the capsids are the interference SE RNAs. And these are really very interesting targets because you can directly approach mRNA, the pregenomic RNA, so no viral proteins will be produced anymore. And if you reduce the viral proteins, this will help the immune system to recover, leading to a functional cure. And these substances are very effective. 
early phase one study is showing that within months of treatment, you can really quite effectively lower HBS antigen really by targeting with these drugs. And now we have phase two studies combining as eRNAs plus capsid inhibitors. There are the nucleate acid polymers, the S release inhibitors. And to be honest, so far, the drugs with the most impressive results, nearly all patients lost S antigen, as you can see here, quite rapidly. It's a bit strange approach because people were treated with this NAPS plus tenofovir plus PEG interferon. Most patients achieved in serum anti-HBS quite rapidly, very high levels. HPV and DNA um, came down, but this was associated with ALT flares, significant ALT flares, up to 1,000 in nearly all patients. The authors believe this is immune mediated, but I think we can't exclude whether it's also a toxic effect um, of the, due to the inhibition of the release of the HBS antigen. So this has to be seen. The last word on entry inhibitors, they were mainly used in the Delta population and during the ELILC, they showed nice result in combination with interferon median HPV and A level. Nice reduction, also some S losses have been seen, ALT normalization, so very good results. And from Pietro Lamperticus group in Milan, they showed an off-label use where they used high dose Mercledex B, the entry inhibitor for cirrhotic patients with hepatitis delta. And you see here HPV RNA became undetectable, ALT normalized just by a monotherapy with this entry inhibitor, and tolerability was very good but you have to give it subcutaneously every day. Well, I would like to conclude with a few words on the um, immune therapy. I already mentioned the different approaches with the direct immune therapy with cytokines, uh, sorry, with the indirect with cytokines or the direct with therapeutic vaccination or engineered T cells or PD-1 um, blockation. I think we need a combined approach here, and so far we do not have really strong data. Most therapeutic vaccines failed so far to show something, and it's also always a risk if you stimulate the immune system that you might have an overstimulation, and we know it from the PDH, um, PD-1 blockade from the immune checkpoint um, inhibitors that you may have a lot of um, autoimmune side effects in these patients. And, but this is the study I would like to conclude because it's really a kind of a proof of concept study for the first time that an immune checkpoint inhibitor was used in patients with chronic hepatitis B. All patients were virally suppressed with a nucleoside treatment and it, they received just one or a second dose of the immune checkpoint inhibitor. And you see with the higher dose there was some S decline and one patient who lost HBS antigen quite rapidly within weeks and you see what happened and I think this is certainly the proof of concept that we can achieve something by immune modulation. After the nivolumab treatment the patient developed a flare although HPV DNA was suppressed and this flare was followed by an S decline and some um, we saw some simulation of the T cells. So with this last and probably promising um, results, I would like to conclude and thank you very much for your attention.